All right, let me start by praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to study these things about the last judgment, the last day, and the the vindication of your justice and your mercy for those who believe. We pray that as we study these things that they would make us more reverent and more urgent to declare the gospel to those who we know in our lives, to warn them of this day and to live in light of it. We pray that you would bless us in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've got three more weeks here, including today, and then two more weeks after. And the the next two weeks will be on the eternal state, and so that would be hell next week, and then the new heavens and new earth on the final week. But between the second coming and that, we have the final judgment. And I'd like to open up with a statement by R. L. Dabney, which I think sets us up very nicely in terms of the rationale. Why does such a day make sense? He says, it might seem like the purposes of God's righteousness and government might, at first view, be sufficiently satisfied by a final distribution of rewards and punishments to men as they successively passed out of this life. But His declarative glory requires not only this, but a more formal, forensic act by which His righteous, holy, and merciful dealing shall be collectively displayed before the universe. For His creatures, both angels and men, are finite and would remain forever ignorant that's supposed to say ignorant, sorry, uh, of a great part of his righteous dispensation unless they received this formal publication. By the way, that's another um, reason we gave for why full preterism is wrong, why it's heretical, but also why it just, in terms of a worldview, is unsatisfying. There's something gaping in the end uh, that, th- that the full preterist view doesn't, you know, it doesn't answer this question. What about vindication? What about the finality of, of God's justice? Not only for, as we'll see, for those who are objects of Judgment Day, but also for His own justice to be upheld. So, this is our outline. We're going to look at the, uh, the time and the place of the final judgment. We'll look briefly at the imagery of the sheep and the goats. We'll look at the basis and scope of the judgment, and that might be the the biggest section, and then the crowns and rewards, and there in the fourth section we're really dealing with just the believers. So let's first look at sort of the atmosphere, the if you could call it that, a lay of the land. But before I even get to that, there's, there's a subject that's usually uh, treated in eschatology, which I did not, and that is the intermediate state. And part of the reason is because in the last couple uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism sessions, we, we went into that. Um, so, I, and, you know, you have to be selective in what you, what you cover and what you don't. But there, just briefly, talk about this for a little bit, in between this, you have an intermediate state in between the day of one's death and that day. I, I do purposely have those question marks right there. That wasn't just me. Uh, running out of time this week. But here we have sort of a, a, a graphic display of that which is clear in the New Testament and that which is not as clear. Not to say that it's not, that there's nothing about it. We're going to look at some verses here. But there is more that is known about the believer's intermediate state. Um, WGT Shedd calls the difference between, really he stands in the whole line of Reformed theologians that will We'll talk about this immediate and final judgment, if there's an immediate one. They'll use the language of a private versus public judgment. And just some verses to talk about the, what initiates the intermediate state, and some of these are general. Some of these, especially in the wisdom literature, and there I mean Job to Song of Solomon, to Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes as well, some of those passages don't differentiate when you're someone talking about going down to Sheol. And so, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God 
who gave it. But see, it's not just returning to dust. You see, it's, it's returning to God in some way. So let's uh, keep looking at some other ones. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now here, in this context, you think, well, Paul's talking as a believer to other believers. That's true. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Uh, there's a, a section of Psalm 139, 1 through 6, where David talks about God's omnipresence. And it's something that is both the supreme terror to the unbeliever and the supreme comfort to the believer. But he, but he uses that expression, where shall I flee from thy presence? Um, if I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. And so, um, is he speaking for the believer or for the unbeliever? Or both? Is it just generic? Um, well, Paul, in that passage, talks about knowing fully. Is that just for the believer? We'll keep reading, and I think you'll see a pattern there. Uh, Shedd argues from this state to the necessity of knowing your final state. In other words, just because of the nature of the way each person died, I don't mean the nature of it individually. I just mean believer or unbeliever. That will intensify. Now, there's a classic passage for this, an immediate judgment, and that's Hebrews 9.27. It says, Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Easy objection to that, you can imagine. After that just has to mean after that. It doesn't mean an immediate first judgment. Well, logically it may not, but it does. you add that into the record... And you start to build a case for there to be some sense, whatever that looks like. The Bible's not clear about what that looks like. Um, there, there's a great, if you're wondering, Sheol, how does that play into this in the Old Testament? There's a great article, and I point you to it because I'm, I don't have time to settle the dispute. Uh, one Old Testament scholar, T. Desmond Alexander, wrote an article that you can find online pretty easily about four different views that have been taken about Sheol in the Old Testament. And what he sort of concludes is that even if you take all these together, and you allow that the Jews had a sort of a common view that even pagans had, and then the Scriptures are coming in and building on that, but not necessarily telling us everything about it. Even there, if you take the cumulative evidence, you can see that it's a place of, of a curse. In other words, even if, even if Old Testament saints can talk about it in some way, it's not the ideal place to be, right? Uh, there, there's, it's, it's not, there's no finality for them. And so, um, Jesus contrasts this state with another state. Uh, you've, the expression in the New Testament, Abraham's bosom, which you could say, well, you know, Matthew 8, 11 just uses the expression of many will come to uh, recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Abraham's bosom as the fellowship meal was used in those days. That's just an expression for being included in the covenant of grace, for Gentiles being included stuff. Maybe, but Jesus uses this language in Luke 16, 22, 23, the poor man, this is the parable of uh, Lazarus, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Again, somebody can say to that passage just in isolation, that's not meant to teach us everything about hell and heaven, and it's not the final hell anyway. So maybe all he's teaching there is the unbridgeable chasm aspect, that you, once you die, you, you know, Hebrews 9, 27. You can't pass over. Maybe that's all he's telling us there. I, again, I don't know. But when you start stacking up more and more and more passages that do talk about a first initial sense in this intermediate state, and if you're a believer, that is peace and, you know, with Christ, and you're sure of it, then it, it, it makes it difficult to, to deny that there's some kind of initial sense of judgment or experience of judgment for those who are unbelievers. More neutral passages on Sheol in the Old Testament. When I say neutral, I just mean passages that say it's, it's a reality. There is a conscious reality and so forth, even if it's not distinguishing between believer and unbeliever. Job 10, 21, 22, 
Before I go, I shall not return to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of gloom, like thick darkness, like deep shadow without any order, where light is as thick darkness. And Job 26, 5 and 6, the dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God and Abaddon has no covering. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. And then a bigger passage, which I won't, I won't read, Isaiah 14, 9 through 11, pretty much does the same thing except it does it with kings to level them and humble them. You're going the same place as everyone else, even with that, who are not kings. But then there's other passages that talk about Sheol with more of a sense that it is a curse. Uh, Psalm 6, 5, for in death there is no remembrance of you, in Sheol who will give you praise? You might say, well, how's that a curse? Well, it's because your relationship to God there is, is cut off. Uh, there's no praise there. So Psalm 16, 10, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. That's one that's fulfilled in the New Testament about Christ, but... Same thing, Isaiah 5, 14, Therefore Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure, and the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude will go down, her revelers and he who exalts in her. So pretty clear the context there is this is a punishment for you who are leading in Jerusalem for being unfaithful leaders. Okay, so I, I put all that in passing because we can't, uh, you know, time doesn't allow us to, to get into that and have a definitive judgment on that. But when you do fast forward to the final judgment, to that day, just very simply, I have this picture of that happening. Christ has returned. This is all immediate. And then there's some division, and, and there's a debate about the passages that talk about the relationship between the present world and even that judgment day. So I won't even get there yet. What's happening in these passages to the present world? There are verses that support the ending of the old world and even in the imagery of fire. I've mentioned this passage in passing, 2 Peter 3, 7 and 10. And notice the effects of Christ's last day triumph to the old world. It says, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So it links the day of judgment and destruction of the people to the destruction of the cosmos. And then in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And, and some will argue that, that doesn't have to mean actually annihilation. It could be a purifying, which we'll get to that debate. But one passage that, that lends support to it being more total, for the sake of clearing things out, you might say, for this throne room, is Revelation 20, verse 11. It says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky, or the Greek word could mean heavens fled away, and no place was found for them, meaning the heavens and earth, meaning the old creation. Now again, you say, well, but that's revelation. We've already granted that a lot of that is symbolic uh, in some way. Okay, maybe. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Now, nobody debates in this debate that the old world in its form is passing away. Now, that's clear enough from the passage. The question is, is it being purified in this fire and, and transformed instantly, or is it being annihilated and transformed? That's, that's the question. But it was always the expectation that the old order would pass away. Isaiah 51, 6, For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment. Psalm 102, 26, They, speaking about the heavens and the earth, will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. Now, about that debate, uh, Shedd says, um, the fathers, uh, the early church fathers, believe that a general 
conflagration will immediately follow the last judgment. That was my first antennas that went up. Will immediately follow the last judgment. Does he mean there when Christ returns on the earth that judgment, or does he mean the final? That'd be, I'll come back to that because it's a little awkward. Which some said will destroy the world, while others ascribed only a purifying agency to it. And he quotes Augustine here, or he cites him in the city of God. He holds that this world is to be changed, not destroyed, and is to be the new earth spoken of by the apocalypse. Now, let's add to this survey that uh, Charles Hodge, for just one example, held the same view as Augustine, and he makes four arguments for it. Number one, that... Um, let's go back to that picture. Um, number one, when you look at 2 Peter 3, the verse we looked at about the heavens being burned up, it's very strong imagery, that Hodge says, combustion need not mean destruction of substance. Secondly, that this fire is analogous to the water of the flood. So Peter's making an analogy between the judgment of the flood... And God's saying He would not do that again, but he, he didn't say He would not destroy the world in some way. But the analogy is to the flood, and so Hodge says the first did not imply annihilation, so neither should the second. Third, elsewhere this transformation is referred to as a renewal, and he cites three verses. And then fourthly, there's no evidence in either Scripture or science that substance is annihilated. I wonder in Hodge's case if he's leaning a little bit too much on the, the scientific consensus of his day, but at any rate... He is still in the majority with Augustine and others like Irenaeus, Chrysostom, Jerome, Luther, and Turretin. In fact, Luther, I'll probably butcher this quote, but Luther said something like, um, all of the cosmos or all of the, the universe, the heavens and earth, wear their workday clothes and the new creation wears it, it puts on its Sunday best or something like that. Uh, he was saying that in this substance, or, or sorry, in this context. And then Turretin holds the same view, but Turretin adds, this shouldn't be a contentious matter because they're, they're both sides could uh, base arguments on Scripture. Um, what about a separation? You know, there, I, it was odd the way Shedd put that, that it's after the judgment, because that doesn't make any sense, because after the judgment, the wicked are, are put away, so, um, you know, why would they... Um, I said that backwards. That the judgment happens after the annihilation, um, and that becomes awkward, because then in that new transformed world, the wicked are there at least for the judgment. So I, I think he meant that judgment of Christ uh, coming on the last day. But anyway, some people point to uh, the Bema judgment. I've gotten this question before. What about the Bema judgment or the separation of judgment? And dispensationalists will hold to different views and others that will talk, they'll see different. You'll see this with the crowns too. They, they put, in my opinion, way too much emphasis on different ways that it's described. And so you see here, there's a separate judgment. There's a third judgment. There's, a, there's an ongoing judgment uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so one way to do that is to point to this word uh, bima that's used in Matthew 27. Now, in Matthew 27, 19, it's used of uh, earthly thrones. And you'll see that in Acts, it's used of different earthly uh, judgment seats. Okay, and, but it's used in this heavenly context in Romans 14, 10, and 2 Corinthians 5.10, and we'll look at 2 Corinthians 5.10 a little bit later in a different context, but they say, so that what they're getting at is, what about the Bema judgment? What about the white throne judgment? What about the one that's for believers versus unbelievers and so on? But, but that is all wrong-headed. Uh, the, the mere difference of a word by itself doesn't demonstrate a totally separate judgment for believers. Um, nor do the many passages that we'll look at that speak of a judgment of rewards for believers, so not condemnation. That's not talking about a different day or, or like after the millennium or something like that. In other words, after the premillennial millennium. <laughs> it's all after the millennium in the other views. But, but it doesn't automatically mean that there's a separate day or a separate kind of throne or a separate throne room. Um, so I would just say that. I mean, even when you look at the passage in Matthew 25, twice the word then is used in verse 31 and 34, and then the believers are addressed. But if you just look at the sequence, there it's talking about Christ judging the world, and then this judgment, and then, and then he turns to the believers, those on his right. But again, it's not talking about a separate day. There's no elapse of time or anything like that. Um, and again, nor is this an extended period of time. That's very unnatural because it's always called judgment day or the last day or on that day and so forth. So going from time to uh, space, if, if you can call it that, and looking at the, uh, the lay of the land here, 
it is talked about as a throne room. And it is talked about as transcending the present cosmos. I read uh, Revelation 20, verse 11, that when this white throne shows up, he who's seated on it, it says, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. So I, I can tell you this, whether it's an annihilation or not, you won't be thinking about the old world. You won't be thinking about those details at that point. And then at the very least, the passage is communicating that, that all eyes will be on Christ. Uh, all will be present. I know that's kind of 101, but it's, it's worth mentioning because of John 5, 29, a passage we've looked at a bunch of times, the, the resurrection of judgment is mentioned there. So if both groups are immediately transported, uh, both the righteous and the wicked will be present. They'll be present spiritually and bodily. Well, the second point, after we get the lay of the land, are the two groups. And there's only these two groups. And in Matthew 25, 32, and 33, it says this, and this is Jesus speaking, Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So notice right away, it's an analogy. As. A shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. By the way, <laughs> that's a good point. So I, because left and right are used, I didn't do this from our perspective. I did it from as if I tried to find an aerial view, but behind, from behind the throne, just to signify so nobody gets confused, the goats on the left, the sheep on the right. Because that actually does matter, the imagery. So, the question of imagery, why the sheep and the goats? Well, the sheep draws our attention to the way that Israel and God's people are always depicted, and specifically, God is their shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23, 1. Ezekiel uh, 34, that the shepherds of Israel were abusive, and so what does God say? I will come down myself and be their shepherd. You see the fulfillment of that in John 10. Uh, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I'm the one who said I was coming down to gather my sheep. So the expression here, Matthew Henry suggests, may be taken from Ezekiel 34, 17. The expression, I mean, as a shepherd does this. There's an action here. Ezekiel 34, 17 says, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats, Notice they're called sheep and sheep at first. He's, he's distinguishing. It's a mixed body at first between rams and male goats. But why the right and the left, you might ask, besides the Latin sinister? But besides that, just talked about that. Um, the sheep on, on the right, here the imagery is the right hand of power. So in the ancient world, if you were seated on the right hand of the king, that was this position of favor. Sometimes right arm would be used to signify the Lord's deliverance. And so there would be the power of the king. But when you were seated or placed on the right of the king, you were in the position of favor. Sometimes that would signify that you had uh, half of the kingdom, that you shared in his rule and his reign. And so the sheep are being elevated to a lot more than sheep at this point. So, um, naturally, this is figurative. It's very important to remember that that is figurative. Remember that the wicked will be raised bodily, just as the righteous, and that specifically to have bodies with natures that can be eternally blessed or can be eternally punished. We'll see that in the next two weeks. But, but do remember that connection from Matthew 10, 28. He who can cast both body and soul into hell, Jesus says, or in John 5, 29 that we just looked at, that they're raised to a resurrection of life or a resurrection of judgment. Now, how are they addressed and what do they experience? In other words, what will it be like? And there, there's a lot of wrong ways to speculate, and speculation in and of itself is wrong, but if you're connecting dots of things that are revealed, I would say this, this will be the fullest sense of self-consciousness ever and conceivable 
um, to die in sin or to die in righteousness will leave no doubt. And this is part of the argument for an immediate judgment as well. It's called to die in that state. John 8, 21 and 24, where Jesus says you will die in your sin. He says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. That threefold expression, die in your sins, is not just talking about that you will die sinning in some particular way, nor is it talking just about your legal standing. That's all true. But in addition to that, your consciousness, you don't have to worry that you will not know when you die. You're not going to have to worry about some state of limbo or some other barely conscious state where you will not know. So to die in that state is to live in that state in a fuller sense, to experience in that state, to persist in that state, and even to increase it. Revelation 22.11 says, Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. The way the King James says it, maybe more emphatically, the wicked be wicked still. The imagery there is an exponential trajectory that you are, and this is part of what C.S. Lewis was was allegorizing in his book, The Great Divorce, the the fictional book. Um, Part of the problem, though, with that is that he's also opening up the door to to purgatory, but 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 then he wakes up at the end and and it's all a dream. So you could say, well, he wasn't teaching purgatory, but whatever. Who cares about Lewis? But what he he was talking about, though, is that good and evil, by their very nature, intensify grow out in, in beings as those beings go on. And, and you see that in that verse in Revelation. And so, and, maybe, and so I'll say this as maybe more for next week, but again, you don't have to wonder about whether or not there will be any wondering. In other words, any godly regret among the wicked. There will be regret, but not godly regret. Or again, not like, where am I and what is going to happen? There, there will be no doubt. Okay, that, that's the way that the Scriptures talk about it. What about Christ as the judge? Um, all, there are passages that make it sound like the Father will judge, but then there are passages that more clearly talk about the Son judging. And different theologians like Turretin and others have talked about this, that Christ, it is through His agency, and there's a reason for that. Um, so John 5, 22, 23, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, why, is it, why do I say that God, through the agency of the human nature of Christ, don't forget the fact that Jesus Christ has a human nature and will judge as a man on the throne, don't forget he is also God. So he's that he is fully united with the second person of the Trinity. He is the second person of the Trinity. So God, as the triune God, is judging, but it is specifically the agency of the Son. And, and why is this? Is it just sort of a theological speculation? Well, it's fitting that a man should judge the children of Adam, since it was the first man who led the rebellion of mankind. And you always see that in Romans 5, and 2 Corinthians 5, and 1 Corinthians 15, this idea of a man standing at the, at the head of his race in, in various ways, as the first fruits of the resurrection and as the judge. Uh, Acts 17.31, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Why would he bother to say it like that? These pagans don't even... In fact, it's one of the reasons they're making fun of Paul at Mars Hill for, for worshiping a mere man. And, and, and that's what he wants to drive home, is that this Jesus was made Christ, and he is at the same time God, and he is your judge. The basis and the scope of the judgment. Um, maybe our more theological section here. But it is both the righteous and the wicked, and there is talk in Revelation of books being opened. That's that's metaphorical, and there's all sorts of mistakes people make with that, which we don't have time to get into. But what does it mean? Well, the Belgic Confession, Article 37, uses an expression here. It says, the books, that is to say the consciences, shall be 
opened. Well, where do they get that from? Well, Romans 2, 15 and 16, where Paul says about all mankind, he says, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So, the way Paul is using the secrets of men that will be unpacked or exposed is a way of expressing their consciences being opened, their consciences being judged and evaluated by God. This is part of the vindication of God. Again, it's not just that he's, and I'm going to come back to these circles in a second, it's not just that they're getting their due in some way, but God is getting his due in a demonstration of his justice. Part of that is the truth of all things. Uh, Grace pardons here, but grace also perfects nature. And so, one of the aspects of it is that it vindicates God's designs with nature, God's designs with creation, God's designs with redemption, His dealings with men. The justice of God's ways in human action are going to be vindicated. Uh, nobody's going to leave the courtroom with any arguments left. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Notice the connection to the point that we made about the the resurrected body last time. Uh, Paul uses these words here, do for what he has done in the body the body. It's one of the reasons for the resurrection of the body. And this vindication of God includes the kind of repayment that rights wrongs. We sometimes don't focus on that, and understandably so. We, we know the gospel now. We want grace. We don't want justice. That's true. We don't want justice to be meted out on us, but we will actually praise God for His justice. Turretin Uh, wrote this. He says, "...the providence and justice of God, which wish it to be well with the good and evil, with the wicked, demands it. But since this does not happen often enough in this life, nay, the pious are afflicted and troubled with every kind of evil and trial..." This all fits on one, I think it does. "...while the wicked are prosperous and exult." rolling in an abundance of good things. It is necessary that a final and universal judgment be granted by which the deserved punishments may be rendered to the bad and gratuitous rewards be bestowed upon the righteous. Um, If you've ever heard the expression or used it, well, if there is a God, then so-and-so, Hitler or whoever else. Um, And of course, as Christians, you wouldn't preface anything with the words, if there is a God, but, but you know the expression. Um, and, and again, as I said, because we're recipients of grace, we, we might say, well, we wouldn't talk like that anymore. Well, actually, this is part of the gospel, that, that he will, this expression that he uses at the beginning of Mark when he's quoting Isaiah 40, that he will, um, he will level, we would say it today, level the playing field. Every high hill will be brought low. He will bring down the haughty and exalt the humble, and so forth, that is a part of the vindication of God, that there's nothing that goes on in this world that He will not right, that that He will not be seen to be in the right. Second Thessalonians 1 6 speaks this way about Christ's justice poured out on the wicked on the last day. We saw it last week, but He says, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. In other words, God thinks it's right that He will repay for every Christian who has been martyred or persecuted or even the smallest slight against the Christian. God thinks it is just to repay. Luke 16.25, again that parable of the rich man and Lazarus, says, But Abraham said, Child, speaking to the rich man in torment, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. We'll see that with the the rich young ruler today in the sermon. 
um, it, it gives us a caution um, from wishing we had more good things in this life, um, from coveting. It's, a, it's another guardrail, I think, on the Tenth Commandment, just to reflect on that. There's greater degrees of guilt and punishment. So now let's move more into the rationale. I said the basis, the rationale for this judgment. There's greater degrees of guilt and judgment. Again, we know the gospel now, grace, and all sin is worthy of damnation. And so one of the things we do is we say, well, all sin is the same across the board in every direction. That's actually false. And it's actually important. For greater evils, there's greater judgment. Not all evil and sin is equal. Judgment and wrath builds by degrees. Now, it's also true, as we'll see in the sermon today, that the slightest sin, because it is against one who is infinitely holy, therefore, one has committed an infinite crime. That's true. So, all sin is the same in that sense. However, judgment and wrath builds by degrees. Romans 2, 5, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath, this idea of building, up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Uh, scripture teaches greater and lesser degrees of evil. John 19, 11, Jesus speaking to Pilate, Therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Well, how can he speak of greater sins and lesser sins if no sins are greater than other sins? Because it's not true. Jesus teaches this by implication in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, you'll remember the series of, You've heard it said, but I say to you, and, and we saw in the cases of murder and adultery, that yes, there is a sin in the heart and a sin in the hands, and that sin is of the same essence. And again, modern evangelicals are very pietistic, and maybe we want to really get the gospel and nothing else because I'm just trying to cling to the gospel, and that's, that's good and understandable. And so the sin is the same sin all the way across the board. But notice the balance here. There is a root and a fruit and they are the same substance. So it is true that the essence of the sin is the same, but it is not true that the extent of the sin is the same. While there is murder of the heart and adultery of the heart, I don't think anybody would deny the virtue of stopping either of those before they advance to the hands or out into the world. If it was just the same sin in any direction, well, then there'd be no virtue at all in stopping the sin at the root level. Nobody would argue that way, though. There is a greater judgment in Scripture for greater capacities or greater nearness to God or greater opportunities to do good if you don't. So the Jews, for example, by reason of their special privilege, are also first in judgment. Romans 2.9, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. And then he spends the rest of the chapter 2 piling it on Israel. So that he has to start at the beginning of chapter 3 saying, so what advantage is there being a Jew? That question makes no sense unless the weight of the world had just piled on them. And of course, it did because they were carrying the weight of the world. They were carrying the holiness of God to the nations. Those in authority positions are more guilty because of the sheer numbers that they can damage or the extent to which they can damage someone who is weak. And therefore, they're judged more severely. Here's three examples. Leviticus 10.3, Nadab and Abihu had strange fire, and then God judged them on the spot. And you're like, what? That seems so random. It's not random. Aaron was uh, lamenting his son's death. But then it says in verse 3 of Leviticus 10, Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near to me, I will be sanctified and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Meaning Aaron got it. Uh, your, your sons weren't just playing with fire by the strange fire. They were playing with fire being priests of the Lord. And there was so much at stake. Matthew 18, 6, we've seen this already. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So you see that greater judgment for ones who uh, destroy the faith of the most vulnerable, namely children. James 3.1, about teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Why? Because they're also playing with fire. Except here the fire is in the form of words. And James goes on to talk about your tongue as a fire that can destroy 
all these things. So teachers in, in the guilt of heresy have a greater judgment than just a lay person who doesn't you know, understand an essential doctrine. Think of the oracles of woe by Jesus to Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin, to whom he says this in Matthew 11, that it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon, and then later on for, for Sodom, more tolerable for them on that day than for you. Or a chapter later, chapter 12, verse 41, 42, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What's Jesus saying? You have a front row seat. They had the back mezzanine or upper deck section. And if they're guilty, staring at me from afar through Jonah or through Solomon, you are double, triple, quadruply guilty because I'm here. And you're thumbing your nose at me. In what ways do our works factor in? So now we're going to get to the circles when we talk about the basis of the judgment here. Jesus spoke of secrets revealed, of every careless word, or revealing the motives of our hearts. And so there's passages on what sometimes are called uh, the judgment of works. Now, there's a wrong way to handle this. And if you want to hear from that wrong way, which you should not, uh, the past generation was fed by N.T. Wright and the new perspectives on Paul. And they look at Romans 2.13, especially in other passages, and they look at here. There's a judgment of works. And it's the same problem with those who look at James 2 and say, look, James is contradicting Paul. No, no, he's using the word justified here in an evidential context versus a judicial context. In other words, what the, the, the stuff the judge looks at and says, you are perfectly righteous in this case because it's a perfect judge. So nothing you do, in fact, if you scrub and scrub and scrub for a million years in pur purgatory, you still will never, ever achieve the righteousness of God because it's the righteousness of God. And you'll never be God. So, will Christians have to answer for these if these passages are talking about it? I mentioned Romans 2. Here's a couple of verses earlier, 6 through 8. He will render to each one according to his works. For those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And then the verse I was talking about, verse 13, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Notice it's law versus law there, not law versus faith. Paul is not talking about law and faith there. He's talking about Jew and Gentile there and being a hypocrite versus the real thing. So context, context, context. It's talking about evidencing out. I'll, I'll specifically, once I read these verses, I'll show you what I mean by the circles. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And then verse, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each person will receive his commendation from God. Charles Hodge gives a summary of this section, and we'll come back to the picture. He says, God's judgment will not be founded on the professions or the relations of men, or on the appearance or reputation which they sustain among their fellows, in other words, not the surface, but on their real character, on their real acts, however secret and covered from the sight of men those acts may have been. God will not be mocked and cannot be deceived. The character of every man will be clearly Revealed. It's just 1 Samuel 16, 11. Uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. It's all it's talking about here is, is the true sense of things that will be brought to light, which is terrifying enough. So, so let's talk about this. Um, even if you have... So let me explain the circles so before I forget to do it. Over here with the goats, the works come to the surface. The way he talks about in all these verses it seems like the works come to the surface for both. But for the unbeliever who does not stand on Christ, think of the parable of the tax collector and the sinner. Sorry? 
The tax collector, he is, but the tax collector and the Pharisee in uh, Luke 18, 9 through 14. It makes the point to say that the Pharisee stood on his own, while the tax collector stood at a distance, beating his breast and saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. So he is standing on his own here. His works are both meritorious and evidential. And that's what he wants. He's standing on his works and saying, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. I'm good half the time. I'm 99% pure, whatever it is. So for him, his works are the basis on which the judge says, yes, that is a perfect righteousness, because that's what he wants. He wants to stand on his own works. And that'll come to the surface and prove to be his downfall. Now, we know that the believer, Psalm 130, verse 3, if you should mark iniquities, who could stand? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody except for Jesus. So for the believer, for the sheep, our works still do come to the surface, but they're evidential. Now, what does that look like? That's a big question because the Scriptures have these two sets of passages, these justification by faith alone passages where Christ's work is our merit. That is the ground of the declaration that we are righteous. On the other hand, there are these other verses that talk about our work still being brought to the surface. And so the question is, well, how does that get, what does that look like when it gets resolved? If we put all the biblical evidence together, we could say that believers will have the work of Christ stand in as theirs. So all shame will be wiped away, forgotten, as far as the east is from the west, to the depth of the sea, all those verses. We can say we have no need to fear because of that basis. And so we have to remember the analogy of faith to interpret the less clear passages of Scripture in light of the more clear passages of Scripture. We have to reconcile these texts with the text on justification by faith alone. In order to do that, you have to make study of the doctrine of salvation. So that's, that's pretty important. Um, there, and what about some of those texts? Well, it's pretty clear from Scripture that Christians have their sins forgiven. Ephesians 1.7, 1 Corinthians, or sorry, 1 uh, Peter 2.24. And it is the humble who fall on the mercy of Christ and have God's favor, and the proud have the opposite. I mentioned that parable in Luke 18. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 2.12, for the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Isaiah 66.2, but this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit. In Psalm 138.6, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. So, come back to that. So Christ's work is our merit, but the evidence still comes out. Why? Uh, again, you can speculate on that. Will, will we all have that revealed and then worship Christ in His mercy all the more? Or are they not even mentioned? Because that would be consistent with uh, having our shame. Um, so in Romans 10, it says, whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. And my answer is, I don't know. What I do know is that we have nothing to fear because this is the bigger circle in Scripture. And that, therefore, when I look at these passages together, this is evidential only for the believer, and it's really a vindication of Christ's justice and Christ's mercy. Whereas here, the unbeliever stands on his own uh, about those works. Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip some of these sections, more about vindication. Hodge um, adds to this, although it says here I don't have a slide for it, but I thought I did. Yeah, I do. Um, again, Hodge says, wrapping up the section, all self-deception will be banished. Every man will see himself as he appears in the sight of God. His memory will probably prove an indelible register of all his sinful acts and thoughts and feelings. His conscience will be so enlightened as to recognize the justice of the sentence which the righteous judge shall pronounce upon him. All whom Christ condemns will be self-condemned. There he doesn't mean self-condemned, not condemned by Christ. He means also. In other words, there will be no doubt. You will shamefully, if you're an unbeliever, have to agree with the sentence. 
Um, last section, I'll just do a quick version of it, the crowns and rewards of the believers. Some of this can get into in two weeks when we do the last week on heaven, uh, the new heavens and new earth, but the ground and nature of the rewards. Are there different degrees of reward for the children of God? Uh, I'm going to unpack that more in that week, and we'll appeal to some interesting things Jonathan Edwards said about that. But as far as passages that might suggest it, the parable of the sower in, uh, in uh, Matthew 13 uh, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So that we already have some indication that different believers are given different graces. Matthew 6.20, But lay, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. So that's like the good version of Romans 2.5, storing up wrath. Here you could store up treasure. Others appeal to the parables of the talents, or in Luke's gospel, the parable of ten, the ten minas and uh, yeah, minas, and there are differences in the two parables in quite a few details, but nevertheless, both are teaching that idea. Um, calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas, that's Luke 19.13, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, the additional element in Matthew even though there's only three servants mentioned, is that the master actually gives them different degrees leading into it. So that sort of indicates that um, he gave them those graces to begin with. So it's interesting for stuff we'll get into. I'll fast forward past the rest of that parable. Again, we'll deal with that in two weeks on the eternal state. But there is a real, I'll end with this, there's a real cause and effects relationship between our deeds in this life and the capacity of our souls. So we're only talking about people who are saved at this point. So it's not talking about merit for salvation or losing salvation or anything like that, but the capacity of our souls for enjoyment in the eternal state. But two things are excluded here. The idea of merit for salvation and then speculation as to the specifics ob objects uh, beyond what Scripture has said. And that kind of gets to the crown and, and some ways that those are, are talked about. Um, reward. I think I'll save a good chunk of this for the, uh, for the eternal state place. But I, I will just say about the crowns, there are passages about this. 2 Timothy 4, 8, laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. 1 Peter 5, 4, uh, the elders are told about the, the chief shepherd. When he appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Philippians 4.1, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. So this is a set of passages where the souls that you've built up in this lifetime are that crown. Another passage that does that is 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. Um, what is our crown? What is our hope and joy? Is it not you, Paul says, for you are our glory and joy. And then finally, passages on the end of our endurance for Christ are referred to as a crown, the crown of life in James 1.12, uh, and then twice in Revelation 2 and 3, I will give you the crown of life, so be faithful unto death. Okay, so the rest, I think, goes very nicely with the new heavens and new earth, so I'll save the rest of my material for that uh, on that. Any questions or comments? same act, it, that's not where the judgment really comes in. Uh, under the concept of total depravity, everyone produces nothing but evil mm -hmm. unless you're regenerated. Mm -hmm. Once you're regenerated, the quality of what you can produce changes. So when you talk about acts, you're talking about a different topic than when you're talking about the quality of what's produced. This is what we were talking about Friday, about goodness. You can call something good, but you're not really doing good divine level works because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's the quality difference. And that's really where it is. You're not as, you know, that, that saying, 
you're not as bad as you could be mm -hmm. is a judgment on the, the quality of your sins, really. Mm -hmm. It's not the type of sin or the act. Yeah. Because, you know, the, what everybody shows up and says is, well, you're not as bad as Adolf Hitler. Right, right. And the quality of your sin is just as bad as Adolf Hitler's mm -hmm. as an unbeliever. Yeah. That never changes your entire life that you remain an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. The way I understand Hodge here is, first of all, the context is he's, he's only talking about unbelievers here as far as they're having it proved that they need that that their sins are utterly sinful and so i think when he says all his sinful acts and thoughts and feelings to me the way i'm hearing hodge there he's he's speaking generically there so he's like he, all the categories acts thoughts and feelings um that's kind of the way i understand the way he's using those expressions just that the the reprobate are having those um it be proved to them that section, though, is one of works-related. Mm -hmm. The production of works is what you'll be judged by, and it's actually the quality of their works is what they're judged by, mm -hmm. not necessarily the acts, because you and I, as believers, mm -hmm. will have done sinful acts, and we will be judged for those, but the quality is what protects us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, believer and unbeliever can do the same, the same act on the surface, and um, it'll be condemnation only for the unbeliever, because um, it is a different for for several reasons, I guess. But that'd be one of them. But I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of reading Hodge generically here, as, as far as how he's using that. But um, yeah, any. Anything else on any of the other sections or, yep? You didn't bring up the part about, at the judgment, something about some people would be given places closer to the throne based on what they did. And then this goes back to the acts. So if the sinful acts have been forgiven, mm -hmm. it's, would seem that it's the good quotation marks acts. Yeah. And, and maybe the number of them versus not number, or maybe this is, I mean, God's going to decide that. Right. But that would take care of the sinful acts are gone. And mm -hmm. it's only the acts that honor God yeah. that would be judged. Is that yeah, I'm, that'll, I'll get a chance to, to flesh that out more just because the way I ran out of time with the crowns, um, the diversity among believers of, I don't want to say privileges at this point, though it is, but the idea of uh, there being a um, greater and lesser, uh, think of it as diversity of graces that God gives the saints. It talks about that with elders around the throne and, and people being granted to seat here and there and all that stuff. I'll get a chance to get into that a little bit more in two weeks. It, it probably goes better there anyway, um, because there are senses of rewards in heaven um, where there's a diversity, um, and that troubles people for, for a variety of reasons. But one of them is just the idea of competition and envy, and, and Jonathan Edwards answers that um, in a very, very good sermon, and I'll be able to that's probably a better place for it, so I'll, I'll, do that. I'll do that in two weeks where I talk about that. So uh, with that, the cane has come out. I will, uh, I will pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time um, to reflect on these things, and we pray that you would uh, help to retain in our minds only that which is true from your word, um, that things that are speculative or things that are troubling that do not accord with your gospel would uh, fade and um, would not be troubling to us. We would grow in your word in these very things. So we thank you for this time. We pray for your blessing on the entire service today. In Jesus' name, amen.